Good afternoon. And welcome to this Nobel Conference preview event. We are looking forward to an exciting conference in October, Making Food Good. And members of the planning committee wanted the Gustavus community and the St. Peter community to share the excitement that we're feeling. Um, I wanted to share that we have some posters and some information up front. If you haven't seen the postcard with the speaker's names on it or gone to our website, or if you would like a poster that'll be up here, you can come pick one up afterwards. We're hoping that everyone still remembers some of the ideas uh, from recent Nobel conferences, Nobel Conference 43, for example, heating up the energy debate, and last fall's conference, H2O, Uncertain Resource. And we thought in the true spirit of the liberal arts that it would be good to explore the connections between these important ideas of energy, water, and food. So to that end, we have invited an expert in the area, and one who happens to live and work in our area, to light the Nobel Conference fire. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Pam Kittleson, professor and co-chair of the Gustavus Biology Department, to introduce Dr. G. David Tillman. I first heard Dave Tillman talk when I was in graduate school at UC Davis. Uh, World-renowned ecologists used to come, and I used to sit in a room like this every Thursday. And sometimes I would really struggle to find a couple of take-home messages that both combine the, the science of life with some of the most pressing environmental issues facing the world today. But I distinctly remember Dr. Tillman's talk for two reasons. First, I took pages upon pages of notes. Um, and afterwards, I also talked to him and asked him some a few questions, and friends joked with me that I was like a groupie at a rock concert. <laughs> and, but I do think that rock star is the apt term for Dr. Tillman. Um, he is a professor of ecology at the University of Minnesota and one of the most widely honored scientists in the U.S. He recently won the Heineken Prize of $150,000, which is awarded annually to five scholars and scientists from around the world. And many of these scientists go on to win the Nobel Prize. He also is one of the most widely cited ecologists in the last two decades and a member of the National Academy of Sciences. And many a Gustavus student has enjoyed working on his collaborative projects at the Cedar Creek Long-Term Ecological Research Station, which is just north of the Twin Cities. And I would encourage any of you who might be interested in an internship and in field work to check out their website and check out some of the work that they do. It's really interesting. The experimental designs of some of the projects that are there are really stunning in scale. And they have the ability to answer relevant and also practical questions about how native biodiversity might uh, mitigate and also mediate increases in nitrogen or carbon. And these are, are two compounds that we're putting into the atmosphere, <coughs> into the soil at increasing amounts. Today, he's not necessarily going to talk about those activities. He will address instead how we can potentially revolutionize and diversify agriculture while also addressing environmental degradation. So the question that he asks today is, can we feed the world and save the earth? And I'm glad you're here in the audience and join me in welcoming and acknowledging the good work that Dr. Tillman has done. It's a pleasure to be here today, and as I walked in and actually sat for a while on the wonderful lawn outside the building, I mused what would have attracted me inside today uh, after the weather we've had for the last uh, week or so. And I really, I admire all of you for being here, and I really appreciate you taking time away from the beautiful outdoors to try to understand a bit more about the earth and where we're heading. So. I'm, I'm an ecologist, and I'm a theoretical ecologist, and I, I do experimental work and so on, and I just want to tell a little, little story about myself, I think it's sort of relevant. When we were driving down here today, I saw a flock of sheep, which made me remember a time uh, last summer when my family and I were out hiking in the, in the uh, 
Rockies, and I came upon a shepherd with a large flock and thought we'd have some fun. And I asked uh, the shepherd if he'd let me guess how many sheep there were in his flock, and if I did it, would he give me one? <laughs> well, he said yes, knowing I could never do it, and then I studied and counted and used my best skills, and I came up with a number and guessed, you know, 542, and um, he was astounded. I was right. So I bent down, I picked up an animal, and started walking away. He said, hold it. If, if I can guess your profession, will you give me my animal back? <laughs> and I said, well, you, know, you can't do that. He said, well, uh, I think you're a theoretical ecologist. <laughs> I said, why do you think that? He said, well, I'll tell you as soon as you put down my dog. <laughs> <laughs> And I started out as a theoretical ecologist, but I now can tell a dog from a sheep. Uh, and and uh, what I wanted to talk to you about this afternoon is some issues a little bit larger than counting things in ecology. It's really trying to step back from where we are as a species on this earth, and where we're going, and what it means, and how we might be able to make the transition that we're undergoing right now. That we are, as humans, we're undergoing a major transition. In the last 20 to 40 years, for ecological process after process after process, humans have become the largest single factor affecting these processes. Whether it's uh, the rate of release of carbon into the atmosphere, the use of nitrogen, uh, the use of land on the Earth's surface for our own benefit, uh, we are doing these things because we need to do them to live. But we're doing them without knowing what the long-term implications of these actions are. And that raises a whole series of scientific, moral, and ethical questions that I'd like to talk with you about today. So, the Earth. We, we have to remember we live, do live on this finite little uh, ball of rock floating around the sun. And if you think about us as an organism, we clearly have to have food. As an organism, we become incredibly dependent upon energy. We use a lot of energy every year. And we are also clearly highly dependent upon having a planet that is actually livable for us, for our needs, both directly for the climate and so on that we personally need, but also for the climate, the soils, the water, everything else that is required for all of the other organisms upon which we depend. As I like to tell my students, although we like to lie in the sun, we're not plants. We actually live at the expense of other organisms. We're, we are an herbivore and a carnivore. And uh, because of that, we have to care about these other organisms, understand where they live and what, uh, how their lives uh, are affected indirectly and directly by, by how we use them uh, and other things on this earth. So we're at about 7 billion people. We're heading toward 9 or 10 billion. So we're actually going to level off, which is really good news. Um, and. It might be, if we went back several hundred years, you could think about some person, the first people out to Minnesota, plowing up a prairie. You could say, well, they need to grow food as a pretty minor impact. Well, with 2% of prairie left, should we still be plowing it in Minnesota? That's a, a different kind of question. We're at a different point. We're at a point now around the world where similar things are happening. We have things we're trying to achieve, things which we want, things which we need. But when we do them, there are, they are, there are impacts of them. It, well, there are trade-offs we face. When we do things, there are costs uh, as well as benefits. And we have to look at these trade-offs now if we're going to find a way to have a, uh, a sustainable life. So in looking at this, I'm interested in food today. Not so much energy. Energy, climate change is an incredibly important issue. Uh, and it's one that I care about and I do some work on. But food is as much a basic requirement for humans, and how we get food can have just as large an environmental impact as our whole energy need and our energy system has. So you may not realize this, but uh, most scientists who study these issues really do believe that agriculture and its impacts are as important and as, could be as detrimental in the long term uh, as our need for energy and our combustion of fossil fuels. Now, uh, there's good reason why humans are technologically optimistic. We have been able to identify and technologically solve lots of problems. But we also find out that any given technology, when it's used uh, a lot or too much, depending on your perspective, can have some feedback effects, some negative uh, effects. And so I want to talk about that, because ultimately technologies are useful, but how much you use it comes down to being a, a question of morality and ethics. And that's what's happening today in, in the case of food. So, 
Uh, I've never had the pleasure of going through these wonderful caves in the south of France which have art from uh, 30,000 or so years ago. But when I thought about these caves, I wasn't sure, is it really art? Or was it just a, 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 a demonstration, a, a recording of the technology of the era? Think about early hunter-gatherers, how they got their food. Well, about 30 to 40,000 years ago, hunter-gatherers uh, learned how to make weapons, uh, weapons like arrows and spears, and, and to put sharp rocks on the ends to be more effective. And that allowed them to hunt food they never could hunt before. Now, we don't know the density of humans at that time, but I would imagine with a major new source of protein that human population size went up. So we do know that, um, here this is in California. <laughs> Have you ever been to the La Brea Tar Pits in LA? Is it a wonderful place? It's, it's the finest dining on Wilshire Boulevard, and it has been that way for 14,000 years. <laughs> uh, and um, unfortunately, the end result of this uh, fine dining that started with a new technology, the Clovis technology, which allowed these very sharp arrowheads and spearheads to be made and to be hooked onto arrows and spears, that technology allowed people to harvest animals they never could harvest before. I'm sure it allowed human density to greatly increase with all that food they hadn't had before, a whole new resource for humans. What was the end result? By 4,000 years later, over 100 different species of large mammals in the Americas, North and South America, were extinct. 83 genera to be exact, I know, and the number of species is a bit debated. 4,000 years of that technology, and they were gone. And the same thing happened, but just back up for a second. Do you recognize that rhino? Guess where the rhino was from? Well, where all rhinos live, southern France. <laughs> where this where they used to live, it was driven extinct there. The same kind of what's called Pleistocene mass extinction happened around the world as this hunting technology came into being. New technology, more people, uh, a good food source, overuse of technology, massive global extinction. Well, we're heading into something like that period again. Uh, we're going to go from about 7 billion people to maybe 10. There's incredibly ample evidence that, that anyone who's taken ecology and were to, were to graph this would understand quickly that the rate of change in human population is slowing and it looks like we are approaching some carrying capacity. And the numbers are between about 9 and 10 billion for that. So we're going to have about 40% more people by the year 2050 on Earth. So you'd expect that we'll need 40% more things for these people to, to have, to have them live like we can live right now. But something else is happening. We're some of the richest people in the world. In fact, the one billion people who live in the developed countries are the richest people on the world, and the other six billion people are much less wealthy. But their incomes are going up much more rapidly. They are being industrialized. Uh, they are gaining the skills to work in factories, design new things, export product, and their incomes are going up from maybe $500 a year per person uh, a decade ago to maybe two or three thousand now, China about five thousand dollars, and they're heading toward our incomes of twenty and thirty thousand dollars per person per year over the next forty or so years. What happens when people earn more? They consume more. And in fact, if you look at where we're going, the biggest concern most people who look at this issue have is not about having three billion more people. It's about having a world filled with people who have wealth comparable to ours and what they will consume. The drive from increased consumption and its impacts on the environment will be much, much greater than the impacts of having 3 billion more people. It's a 40% versus a 300% difference, if you will, in what is likely to come from population versus consumption. So in the consumption, I'm showing you a curve here that shows how how demand for food crops depends upon income. This is based on all the nations of the world, uh, divided into different groups from the richest nations, uh, the A's and the red dots, and the poorest nations, the Y's, uh, with, the, uh, with the letter, uh, with the yellow Y's, if you will. And it shows year by year from 1961 to 2007, what has happened to per capita individual demand for nutritious crops as a function of income. And in the what, what amazes me about this is despite the cultural differences we see around the world, the different kinds of foods we eat, uh, the different histories that we have in, in our societies, that there's a fairly narrow band in which all of these countries over this period of time are, are contained within. 
So the center line there is the, is the best projection of a, of a line fit through all those data points. And the two outer bounds include 99% uh, of all the variation around that. So what you can see is that as these poor nations, the people in these poor nations become richer, there'll be a much, much greater demand for food. So right now, uh, the United States, the typical citizen demands, uses, about 8,000 calories of food per day. Do you think you guys, do you eat 8,000 calories a day? How many calories does it, would it take, let's say, for me to not gain weight? That'd be a good number for you to know. <laughs> about 2,000. So I want to make a point here about these numbers. I don't eat 8,000 calories a day, and I don't think anybody in this building eats 8,000 calories a day, but because of what you eat, you, you make 8,000 calories worth of nutritious crops being grown. If you look at the total amount of nutritious crops that are consumed by our society in a year and divide with the number of people, you get about 8,000 calories per day per person. That's because a lot of the calories we eat, we don't eat directly. We eat them after we've fed them to a cow or a pig or a chicken or a fish or whatever it might be. That's a part of it. Uh, another part is a lot of the calories that we buy at a grocery store um, go in the garbage can instead of us, because a lot of food is wasted. And grocery stores waste a lot of food. In fact, it's about 30 to 40 percent of all the food that is harvested is wasted, independent of whether you're a rich or poor society around the world. There are different causes of waste in different kinds of societies, but wastage is a very large part. About a third of these calories or protein, if you look at it either way, is wasted every year. Well, the rest of the world, in trying to live like us, uh, there are people around the world, as their incomes go up, they buy more meat. Societies that were mainly vegetarian of uh, economic reasons uh, eat a lot more meat, the demand goes up. And if you take these numbers and project them, you can ask how much more food will the world demand if you use the estimated incomes per capita of, for all the countries of the world estimated by the World Bank for the year 2050, and you scale all the things and move things along the curves are on and so on, on the diagram I just showed you. Depending upon whether you think the major limiting factor in the food will be the caloric content or the protein content, and frankly, it looks like it's going to be protein because people are biasing their diets toward protein. We're going to eat 130 to 140 percent more food in 40 years to feed 40 percent more people. That is a, a lot of food to have to grow. And how we grow that food as we meet this demand. Uh, is going to have major implications for what this world is going to look like 50 years from now. And once we do that, I would say, in essence, forever, for the, for the length of time that humans are on Earth. So how can we get 40%, 140% more food? Well, there are obviously two ways we can do it. One, we could clear 140% more land and, and grow food like we do now on the land that's already cleared. Um, or we could have higher yields on the lands that we already have, or we can do some combination of the both of those. So how much land do we use right now globally for agriculture? I hope that's the next slide. Yes, phew. I shuffle these around when I drive down here. I was not driving. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, you don't have to be concerned about that. I was a passionate. Um, so this isn't the right spot. Good. Well, the whole world has 14 and a half billion hectares of surface area. Of, of land area. A hectare is about two and a half acres. So if you want to think in acres, you multiply everything I'm saying by 2.5. And about six billion of that is land that we just don't want to live on. We don't live, Antarctica's land, not many people live there. Not many people live in tundra or in desert uh, or in wetlands or in, in the far north boreal forests. So the rest of the world that's left that we really consider much more suitable for us is about eight and a half billion hectares. We use five billion hectares of that to make our food. Five billion out of eight and a half is used for food production. Three and a half billion of that is for pasture. So these are drier lands that we graze. And about one and a half billion hectares is used for our crops, corn, wheat, rice, and, and all the other crops that we grow. So five billion acres, if we had to have 140% more land, that would be seven billion hectares more of land. We don't have it. The world does not have enough land for us to give to get 140% more food just by farming more land. 
It isn't there. In fact, there are only about 2 billion hectares of land remaining in the world. Much of it is tropical rainforest and tropical savanna, and a little bit is temperate grassland. This is all suitable for agriculture without irrigation. And there isn't, as you probably know from your conference uh, last year, that much water around to irrigate that much more land around the world. We're really running out of water for irrigation as we are right now. So if it takes one and a half uh, billion hectares to grow our food right now, and you multiply that by 140%, you'll come up with about two billion hectares of land would be needed if, if we had to meet our future food need uh, just by farming more land. Which is to say, we would need to use every last remaining bit of agriculturally suitable land around the world. We have to cut down, clear, burn, bulldoze, whatever we have to do to clear the land with basically all the remaining uh, fragments of rainforest that aren't uh, uh, wetland rainforest, of, of, of savanna, etc., around the world to feed people. Um, well, there it is. I just told you that. So, I could show you pictures of rainforests being burned and bulldozed, but that makes it a bit more distant. Here are some people clearing land in Wisconsin in the 1890s. We did it too. So you have to understand something about the whole ethics and morality of this, is that it's very easy for us to imagine that people who live in tropical lands should, for some reason, not clear their land and farm them, whereas that's our heritage. We did it. What's the, what's the, what are the ethics of the situation if we tell somebody else not to do something that, that we already benefited from doing it ourselves. So here are people cutting trees before chainsaws, before bulldozers. It's a lot easier to clear land now than it was. The technology makes it very easy to buy 100,000 uh, hectares of land in uh, the Amazon and turn it into soybeans. It's happening in that size of farm all the time. Well, clearly when we do that, there's some implications. And here, I'm not going to talk very much at all about my own research, but I had to at least show you one of our field experiments at Cedar Creek. Um, and this is the experiment. There are several hundred plots there. They differ in how many species are planted in each plot. They're all native perennial prairie plants. Some plots have one species, some have two, some have four, some have eight, some have 16. And we did this to try to find out whether the number of species in an ecosystem which we call as biological diversity, or biodiversity, would influence how ecosystems function. Now, when we started this experiment in 1994, um, most ecologists thought that that was a romantic tree hugger fantasy, that the number of species in the ecosystem would affect how it functioned, and that in reality there would be almost no effect. In fact, when our work first came out, we were criticized roundly for having deceived ourselves into believing our results were significant and so on. <laughs> Because the first year of this experiment, things weren't very clear. And there are lots of good reasons to question it. Let me sort of show you, I'm going to show you one data slide about this. I have hundreds I could, I could uh, thrill you with, but I'm not going to. Uh, this just shows the amount of production. If you were to mow each of these plots at the end of the growing season, how much biomass, how much plant mass would there be? And that could be hay you were going to feed it to livestock, or you could turn it into liquid biofuel, um, or whatever. But that's sort of the crop. We found, on average, the plots planted with 16 species were 238% more productive than the average typical plot planted to a single species, to a monoculture. And there are very good reasons why this happened. In essence, these plants coexist with each other in nature, even though they compete. And the only way they can coexist while competing is to have trade-offs, to be better at one thing and worse at something else than each of the other species. And when you do the mathematics, when you write up the differential equation of things competing with each other, uh, where there are trade-offs, where to be better at one thing, you're worse at something else, those models always predict that as there are more species, there's more complete use of that habitat, more complete use of the limiting factors in that environment, and that leads to greater productivity. So this is something that's, that's expected from theory, now that we know that the patterns that we did the theory. Uh, but it's also empirically observed here, and there's a recent review that looked at more than 100 such experiments. We set up the first one of these, but there have been more than 100 experiments looking at how diversity affects the function of ecosystems. And the conclusions over and over are greater diversity leads to greater productivity, it leads to greater stability of the ecosystems. They don't vary as much in response to climate and other disturbances. There's lower disease incidence and greater, more diverse ecosystems. Um, these systems 
As they, as they grow, they actually remove from the atmosphere more carbon dioxide and store it as organic matter in the soils. They make the soil more fertile by doing that. There are an incredible number of effects that biological diversity has on the functioning of ecosystem, effects that have long-term value to society. And these are the kinds of effects that if, uh, as we turn uh, natural ecosystem into farmland, we lose more and more and more of these services that these ecosystems provide. <laughs> Pure water, soil fertility. As you know, many of our medicines, about 70% of our medicines are derived from natural products found in plants and animals from, uh, or microorganisms from around the world. Um, our crops themselves, we have to go back to nature to get genes to overcome diseases that are attacking uh, these crops. Climate regulation, CO2, I mentioned soil effects and so on. There are a whole variety of services that nature provides in the last decade and a half of research and a series of different experiments have convinced uh, most ecologists, we're scientists, there's always skeptics, uh, most ecologists that losing biological diversity is a very unwise thing for the long-term benefit of society. We need the 300, sorry, the 3 million other species with which we share this earth to be there functioning, to provide us with the ecosystems uh, upon which we depend for a variety of services. So what I would say is that a simple approach of trying to meet global food demand by clearing more land is not going to be a very wise approach. Uh, we would really destroy the biological diversity of the earth in doing so. So what about crop genetics? Have any of you heard of the Green Revolution? Yeah? Well, the Green Revolution doubled global food production over a 45-year period. Uh, Norman Borlaug really led this. He was a, 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 an inspirational uh, and, and visionary leader in this, won the uh, Nobel Prize for his work, the Nobel Peace Prize for his work. It, did an amazing thing. In the 1960s, we were deeply concerned about population growing faster than the food supply globally, and there were uh, increasing food shortages and famine and starvation and, and a large number of malnourished people because of it. And the Green Revolution allowed us to double global food production over a, a 40 or so year period. And in doing that, averted what had been a major, and I would assert, a well-founded fear. Well, the Green Revolution has several components that I'll show you. One of the components was crop breeding. For some crops, but not all. For instance, if you look at just uh, normal rice, and you look at how productive the first variety of rice was that was planted in the Philippines uh, to, uh, as the first part of the Green Revolution, that variety is only about 4% less productive, 4% less grain than the variety we plant right now. So all the breeding that's gone on the last 40 some years in the basic rice that, uh, that is the food of much of the, of, the, uh, of the Asian part of the world, its yields have not increased. We have not been able to breed them to get better yields, but in fact, we have to constantly breed a crop to stay ahead of all the diseases and pathogens that attack the crop. So if you took the rice that we first planted in 1961 in the Philippines and grow it now, it's attacked by so many pests, its yield is now about 70% of what it had been in 1961. It's gone down because it does not have the genetic resistance needed for the passage of evolved to overcome it. Remember, we plant huge monocultures of these crops. Thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of acres of land is planted to a single variety of a single species. It's just waiting, if in some sense, for somebody to come and attack it. It's a wonderful food source. Things evolved to handle them. We have to stay ahead of them. So for some crops, we don't have any greater yield now than we had then. But for other crops, maize, and corn, if you will, uh, and hybrid rice, we have been able to increase the fundamental yield of those crops by between 30 and 40 percent over the last 45 years. However, we also know that there's a limit to how much that maximum yield can ever be for a crop. There's a point where the plant just can't grow enough more to give you any more energy and, and protein, etc., to put into a seed that we can harvest and eat. And we see it happening now around the world in our crop. Here's rice, some of the highest rice yields in the world. Uh, occur in China, a little hand farm, two hectare plots, no machinery at all. Hand farm by farmers that know that land incredibly well, get incredibly good yields. And no matter what they do to that, their yields since 1985 or so uh, in two of the regions and since about 1995 in other regions have leveled off. <coughs> They're not able to increase yields anymore. And that, that is not unique. I've done this for every country of the world, and there are uh, about half of the countries of the world have curves that look like this. This is China in total but I could have shown you many other countries, their yield across all their crops. This is the tons of protein per hectare of land uh, 
in nutritious crops grown across all of China, it has been increasing. It's gone up by about a factor of four from the start of the Green Revolution to now. And that factor four, as you can see here, is very tightly associated with how much nitrogen fertilizer is being applied. That was the other half of the Green Revolution. It took big increases in agricultural inputs to give you more food. But there's diminishing returns. As you add more and more nitrogen, you get less increased yield from it. These curves basically are leveling off. And so there are also, you can see here, number colors. Blues were a long time ago, 1960s, going up to reds, which are now, and the bigger symbols are, are the most recent. You can see this temporal progression. Yields have barely changed uh, in, the, in the last about five or so years in China. These curves are leveling off, and this is not the only country I could show you more graphs than you would care to see. This is a very commonly repeated pattern. So we had these higher yields, which allowed us to double global food production in the last 40 or so years because of, to some extent, better, better genetic varieties, but also mainly because of a big increase in uh, agrochemical inputs. Nitrogen, the biggest one, but also phosphorus, irrigation, and pesticides. We see many nations now are reaching this point of diminishing returns. Their yield curves are leveling off. Adding more input is not giving them more return. But as food demand goes up and food prices go up, which they have been doing uh, globally, farmers try this. They add more. They try to get more off their farmland. They can afford to put a bit more in inputs, trying to get a bit more yield and make a bit more profit because of that. That's what's happening in the richer countries of the world. In contrast, we have about 2 billion people living in the 58 poorest countries of the world. And these are people who have uh, annual incomes of about 300 or so dollars per person per year. Their incomes are so low that uh, they basically cannot afford, if they own land, they can't afford to do anything other than put whatever seed they saved from last year back on the ground. They don't have money for any kind of inputs. They don't buy, if you look at these nation by nation, they don't buy fertilizer, they don't buy pesticides, they don't buy improved seed. Uh, they are basically living hand to mouth, trying to feed their children, many of whom are, are malnourished. Uh, we have 1.2 billion that are, have major malnourishment, according to the UN, that are part of these two billion poorest people. If you look at their land and ask how productive could this land be, what you find is they're getting about one-sixth of the yield they could have from that land. And they're not getting that yield because they don't have the inputs, the fertilizer, the seed, et cetera, that, that could give them six times more food uh, per hectare than, than they are getting right now. Now, we're on a trajectory right now where the countries that have the money, the countries, the farmers that have the capital are investing that capital uh, in uh, trying to increase yields on the land they already own. And that, uh, if you look at those projections and the curves we have, it's conceivable to have us get about 70% more food on the sort of business as usual approach uh, for the world. But in doing so, we're going to need about 170% uh, more nitrogen fertilizer to be applied because we're at the curve is getting flat. Adding more nitrogen does not give you that much more food among the farmers of the world who can afford to put, use fertilizer. And if you ask how can we meet the 140% demand uh, that we project there being for the year 2050 for global food demand, we'll need to add that fertilizer and clear about a billion hectares of land. That's half of the remaining land suitable for agriculture in the whole world. Now, just so you can visualize a billion hectares, a billion hectares, the whole United States, counting Alaska and even Hawaii, is 0.9 billion, nine tenths of one billion hectares in size. So we're talking about this would be clearing in the Amazon, in the Congo, and other places around the world, a surface area of land greater than the surface area of the whole United States, having to be cut in the next 40 years. Uh, the species is basically lost, and that land dedicated to farming, if we keep doing what we've been doing in the past. So I want to talk about things we can do that's a little bit different. But first I want to point out something else. I've told you what nitrogen does. It's nitrogen is a little bit like that uh, Clovis arrowhead that the Native Americans used. Using it gave them food, had a wonderful advantage. Using it drove their food extinct, a distinct disadvantage. Well, uh, nitrogen, which is what makes these crops grow such, so much more, 
is one of the major limiting currencies of all of nature. Nitrogen is mainly in the atmosphere as N2 gas, an incredibly stable compound. In fact, it was Nobel who used a very unstable form of nitrogen that released an immense amount of energy when it became stable, N2, to get the money that uh, helped fund this conference and all that stuff. So, uh, <laughs> it's, nitrogen has been limiting life on Earth from the beginning of life, and it still limits most organisms on Earth, the availability of nitrogen. And organisms have incredibly specialized adaptations, plants and, and animals and so on, to deal with the nitrogen, the protein that, that, that is available for them and to use it. And what this means is that when we have so much nitrogen of agricultural origin, it's more nitrogen from agriculture now gets into the lakes, river streams, and terrestrial ecosystems of the world that comes in from all known natural processes. We've doubled the nitrogen economy of, of nature. And because of that, there are big impacts of this on these ecosystems. It is basically a pollutant. And we are polluting the lakes, rivers, oceans with the nitrogen, also with phosphorus from agriculture. And some of this uh, evaporates into the air and comes down as rain, and we're polluting the terrestrial ecosystems with this nitrogen deposition. Uh, and I've worked on this for a long time. I'm not gonna uh, bore you with all my pictures. I'll show you even more dramatic pictures just from the Gulf of Mexico. Here's a, a place in the Gulf which doesn't have uh, nutrients coming in from a river, such as the Mississippi, which dumps just basically drains the farmland of the upper Midwest and dumps the extra nitrogen that those crops don't take up into the Gulf of Mexico. And here's what happens when you're closer to where the river comes in. The nutrients in the, in the water, the nitrogen, encourages massive growth of algae. Uh, when the algae grow, they eventually die. When they die, bacteria consume them. The bacteria take up the oxygen. The water has no oxygen left in it. Fish can't live in water that doesn't have oxygen. This is called the dead zone. It was named that by the fishermen who went out there and could never find any fish to catch it. It was dead. And that dead zone is larger and larger, and all of the major rivers that drain agricultural lands around the world have dead zones on them now. And if we keep doing what we're doing, they'll be 170% bigger in 40 more years. I can show you the same kind of things happen. Terrestrial ecosystems change when they have nitrogen coming in. They lose uh, biological diversity. We've seen that in our prairies. Uh, but I want to move on now here. And just look at this. Uh, so the question is, do there have to be massive negative impacts, environmental impacts, of trying to feed the world, of providing the world with 140% more food? Or might there be some alternative solutions? Well, um, clearly, something which can increase yield is very important. So we should keep investing whatever we can in trying to improve the fundamental yields of crops. Um, but there's something else that I think you should, and I hope it's been obvious by what I've said so far, there's an immense amount of already cleared land that is in the poor, these poor 58 countries of the world. Land that is giving very low yields right now. Um, these farmers don't have the capital to buy seed and fertilizer and so on. They don't have the knowledge to, to use those efficiently uh, in agriculture. And it's that knowledge, lack of knowledge and lack of capital which causes them to have yields that are so much lower than the yields that we see in the more developed countries of the world. So um, this is, here's, India is not one of the poorest countries. It's a middle country. It's a developing, not a least developed country, according to the UN. M middle incomes. And they have moderate rates of end fertilization. But if you look at India here versus China, I already showed you China, look at India. Basically, there's still a straight line relationship between the rate of addition of nitrogen fertilizer and the yield. And that means that uh, instead of having diminishing returns when you add more nitrogen, you keep getting greater and greater food production for these countries up to some point. And looking across all the developed countries in the world, these curves tend to uh, uh, be uh, leveling out at around an input of about 0 0.15. 0 0.15 uh, tons of nitrogen per hectare per year of nitrogen fertilizer. And I, again, I can't show you all of those. That's just a, sort of a ballpark. So we just asked a question. What would happen if we, instead of having more nitrogen, 170% more nitrogen, be applied to the already heavily fertilized lands of the richest countries, what might we be able to achieve in terms of global food production if we had uh, a way to provide a moderate amount of nitrogen to farmers who, have, uh, who are very poor, these poorest two billion farmers of the world, um, a moderate amount, here we said a 0.12. So that's where the curves are still almost just starting to have an inflection point in most of these curves. 
Uh, what if we could have the, the, those countries, those farmers, have that amount of nitrogen uh, for their crops? We then went through the mathematics of all the effects of climate and soil and so on on yields in the developed countries, applied those uh, multiple regression equations country by country to, to these uh, poor countries of the world, and we calculated we could get 71% more food by doing this globally. A global increase of 71% in food production, and we would only increase global nitrogen application by, uh, what is it, 36%. That's a huge benefit, a very efficient way to use nitrogen to feed the world. And when you're doing this, you can ask, well, how much land would that uh, save us? Well, if we have current yields, we, we need 2 billion more hectares, all of the wild lands left on, on the world that are suitable uh, to be converted to food. If we went to this moderate rate of end fertilization to, in, in these poorer countries around the world and brought them up to 0.12 tons per hectare per year, we now only need 570 million more hectares of land. Not 2 billion, it's 0.57 billion hectares, about a half a billion hectares. And if we can keep having the, the yield potential of our crops go up a bit, going up, going up by let's say 30% over by uh, 2050, we're down to needing almost no new land at all. 0.125 billion hectares, 125 million hectares. It's all the land the whole world would need to provide 140% more food by the year 2050. So what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is there are trade-offs, there are costs. We can lose biological diversity to land clearing. We can have the environmental impacts of, of nitrogen, but we do need the food. And there's, there's some wiser approaches between what we're doing right now and, and, and that could help us achieve what we'd really like to achieve. And doing so really comes down to an ethical question. I mean, right now, our farmers buy their own fertilizer for themselves, put it on because they're, they're going to make more money. That's how the world works. We have a problem. We have people who, are, who control a vast amount of, of fertile land in lots of little plots in these poorest countries of the world who don't have the money or the knowledge to uh, have yields go up very much at all. They are really subsistence farmers, but the land they have is actually very good land. They have good climates. We've been through this pixel by pixel on, on, on global agricultural maps of the world and looked at the soil, the climate, etc the soil carbon, the nitrogen, the pH, all these characteristics that influence yield, the rainfall, the, the mean annual temperature, all these variables we've included in our models, and, and that's what tells us we have the ability to have these lands give us 70% more food globally if we use them properly. Well, how are we going to um, have this happen? Well, if people don't have the capital to start doing this, we have to have some way, and here I'm not a social scientist, and I'm hoping that many of you here are, or many of you might like a challenge like this, because it's one thing to show you some mathematics, saying that we could achieve um, a world in which we need almost no more land clear compared to now, and have much lower impact of our agrochemicals by farming more wisely. But doing that means we have to somehow have people who can barely farm right now start farming in a more uh, productive way, but also a wiser way. And how do we have that happen? It's to our long-term benefit to have this happen. It's the long-term benefit of all people who will live on the world 50 years or 100 years or 10,000 years from now that we do this transition properly now. 50 years from now, that land will be cut down. The biodiversity will be gone. It's not going to come back. So how do we undergo this transition? How do we help people do this? I don't have clear, simple answers. I think uh, I'm a firm believer in, uh, in the ability of individuals to be wise in investing in their own future, but if people who are so poor have nothing to invest in their own future, they really can't do it. So I think we have to have some kind of program that can provide seed money, if you will, or fertilizer money to get things going in a way where the profits, the increased yield, can partly buy more for them year after year, just like farmers in the US and all, all, all the other rich country farmers have been able to develop the capital they need, eventually growing slowly through time. But we have to start it somehow. Now, the, the government of Malawi did this. Uh, they started about seven years ago, handing out about a, a, a 15 or so pound bag of fertilizer and a bag of seed to five or so thousand farmers in their country. And they went from being a net importer of grain, grain that was being eaten in its own right, but also fed to some livestock, to now being a net exporter in a very small program. And farmers were given this, were told how they should use it and so on. And they, they had this big shift. In this, admittedly a very small country, but a big shift. I calculate that 
the capital I think it might take to do this is in the range of 20 to 50 billion dollars. So, um, would you start passing the plate? Thank you. <laughs> uh, that's a lot of money. But let me just give you some idea about these things. I have also done a lot of work on biofuels. Uh, you might imagine that anything that competes with hungry mouths around the world for food, I don't appreciate very much, which is my response to how we're doing biofuels right now. But in the United States, we have a program that by the year 2020, according to the current law, will provide subsidies of $15 billion per year for the production of biofuels out of, out of food crops. $15 billion per year, every year in the United States, to have us divert food from people's mouths to the tanks of SUVs. Um, and that amount of money, once or twice, wisely invested, uh, given to people with enough, so they can learn how to increase their yields and invest some of their increased yield in having a high yield the next year and let that grow through time. That money could change how the poorest people of the world farm their land and the benefits that we as a global society receive from them because of that. Now, our country and most of the other richer countries have, as I said, a different problem. Uh, we have incentives for farmers to apply more and more inputs if it gives them enough money to, uh, it gives them enough feedback to earn a little bit more profit from doing it. Um, and so right now we're not rewarding our farmers. We give a lot of subsidies to our farmers. On average in the U.S. and the EU, half of the income of a typical farmer comes from governmental subsidies. Half of the income. Uh, but the subsidies aren't rewarding farmers for what we probably truly ultimately value. We do, we do value food. We All of us eat. Some of us eat a bit too much. Um, but we all eat. We know that's a value to us. But we also care about the quality of our habitat. We care about water quality, uh, pesticides, and so on. Uh, we care about climate change, which is another big issue I'm not having the time to talk about today, not just the foods that are produced. So there's been something interesting which happened in a couple European countries in response to laws which uh, made it harder for farmers to get nitrogen fertilizer, trying to help prevent the overuse of it. Here's Germany, the same kind of graph I showed before. This is yield of all their nutritious crops. This is protein content, um, tons of protein per hectare of land. The blue dots were 1960s, uh, going to the grayer dots, 1970s, uh, then going up here to the 80s, and finally the reds are uh, the late 1990s and, and this decade. And look what's happened. For a long time, higher yields came from increasing nitrogen. And basically, when there are restrictions on nitrogen, farmers learned how to get even higher yields with less nitrogen. And this is why I'm saying that I think a rate of end application of around 0.12, they're, they're, they're sitting at 0.18 right now, uh, is plausible. And it's plausible we can actually have the richer countries, which use so much nitrogen, achieve that. Italy has done the same thing. Switzerland has done the same thing. And Mexico has done exactly what I'm showing you for Germany also. The United States hasn't done it. The European countries did it because there were legal restrictions on using fertilizer. Mexico did it because fertilizer is expensive. And those farmers don't have a lot of extra money. And they found they could get just as good a yield with less nitrogen to put. So we can be more efficient in how we farm. And finally, the last point I want to make is that we can be uh, more efficient in what we eat. Now, I know you already know these things. Uh, but as somebody who read uh, Francis uh, Morla Pay's book when I was a grad student, she'll be one of your speakers for the Nobel Conference on Food next year, uh, and who really admired what she said uh, about how to be a vegetarian and so on, but also read, uh, she's a nutritionist, what she knew about animal nutrition. Uh, it's been interesting to see what we do know. Right now, it takes about eight kilograms of grain to make one kilogram of edible beef. It takes about five kilograms of grain to make an uh, edible kilogram of pork. It's about two for poultry, and some farm-raised fish, tilapia and um, salmon, is about a one-for-one one deal. Now that might sound impossible, right? We all we all have metabolism, but it's one pound of dry grain to give you one pound of wet fish. And uh, I what what percent of water am I? Eighty percent, ninety percent? I should know this. 60 or 70? 67, okay. A lot of this is water and a lot of grain isn't water. So it's, there isn't a free lunch there. But everything I told you we can do by um, decreasing the need to uh, cut rainforests, to plow down the world's uh, tropical savannas, uh, and use high rates of nitrogen input is to meet 
a global food demand projected to be at 140%. That food demand assumes that the rest of the world is going to eat the way we eat. That's how the rest of the world is going. As they get incomes, there seems to be something inherent in, in our hunter-gatherer roots, I would guess, that we want more meat in our diet. And that's what people do all around the world, culture after culture after culture, um, except for a few vegetarian cultures, uh, do that. And this is the inefficiency that we face in conversion. So just changing, the, if we, let's say, um, if one were to eat the same total amount of meat, but have it be mainly aquaculture, uh, fish and poultry versus pork and beef, that would have a huge influence on food, global food demand in the future. So dietary shifts that way could be very important. Now, if, since you get to bring these Nobel people in here and so on, you, you tell the Nobel committee, I want a new prize. I don't want it for myself. I want a food prize. I want a food prize given out to the best, most creative cooks in the world to come up with dishes that are easy to make, nutritious, and taste so good that people will want to make them for themselves, but that use much more efficient ingredients, environmentally efficient ingredients. If we did this, and everything else I told you, we might need significantly less land than we have in agriculture 50 years and 100 years and 1,000 years from, than we have right now. This is the other really big aspect. The fourth one I want to just briefly mention is clearly wastage. About a third of our food is wasted. Ways to decrease that wastage could also be a very important part of a solution to the global food and environment issues that we face. Now, I want to take another step back. because it, it's, um, I don't think we often think about the global context in which we live and the feedback effects that there are. But when food prices spiked a, a year and a half or so ago, there were food riots in something like 40 different nations of the world where people were literally in the streets rioting because they could not afford to buy food anymore. When corn went up so much, people in Mexico rioted because they could not, most of their diet is wheat, is corn. Corn doubled in price. Many Mexican workers would spend about half of their weekly income buying corn products for their family to eat. When corn doubled, they couldn't do it anymore. And so the poorest people in the world, if they're not farmers, are very dependent upon the price of food. And uh, the stability of nations is very dependent upon the price of food. China uh, has a rapidly growing economy, very rich people. They love eating meat. If you visit them, you'll know this. If you're their honored guest, you'll eat every animal part you've ever imagined, uh, and then some. Uh, and they are wonderful hosts, uh, and it's very thrilling to do so. But you can see a country that no longer can provide itself with its own food. So let's say, and what happened during this uh, price spike was China's neighbors, for whom they would buy rice and wheat, refused to export them to China because they said they needed them for their own citizens. Now, let's say this. You're the premier of the most powerful country in the world with an army of 10 million, and your neighbors won't let you have some food. What do you think? Hmm. I think that uh, it's incredibly destabilizing uh, to have demand for food go up more quickly than we can produce it. Uh, and uh, incredibly destabilizing not to plan for that. I think that it, it could be the source, not only of riots, but of, of wars in the future if we don't really carefully plan how we feed the world. So when I look at this in another way, 1.2 billion mal majorly malnourished people, according to the UN, around the world. 1.2 out of 7 billion people don't have enough food to live. It is our moral and ethical obligation to help them achieve an adequate diet. The good news is, if we help them the proper way to do that, they will be helping us. Because they will be able to grow much more food on that land than they need just to feed themselves, even to feed themselves our kind of diet. They'll actually be able to export food, which will give them an economy and help them become not one of the least developed, poorest countries in the world, but a, a growing economy, uh, but an agrarian-based economy. And in doing that, they can help prevent massive destruction of natural ecosystems, overuse of fertilizer, and so on. So I think we really can save the Earth. We can save its biological diversity for all future generations. We can help prevent some of the uh, environmental uh, harm that comes from modern high-input, high-intensive agriculture. All at one time, we have a, a path forward to doing this that I hope that you will seriously consider. I look at the broad sweep of human history. I talked about what happened in, in Neolithic times with hunter-gatherers and uh, technologies which led them to over-exploit the resources and drive them extinct. 
I imagine that happened. There were lots of hungry mouths out there. And I think that one of the things which is very true about humans is the old saying that necessity is a mother of invention. That was, eight, that was 10,000 years ago, 8,000 BC on this graph. That's when agriculture came into being, right when we drove all those other organisms we were eating extinct. Agriculture was invented. And we've been on a wonderful ride. If you look at this as human population, we're now up to 7 billion people. It's been an amazing ride for society. As we've accumulated knowledge through time, we've had a world that was able to support more and more people. We're heading toward leveling off at about 9 or 10 million people. The issue is, in the next 40 years, how are we going to have that leveling off occur? Are we going to tear down the remaining native ecosystems of the world? Are we going to go to very high intensity systems, something which I think is akin to using the Clovis points so much that we drive hundreds and hundreds or thousands and thousands of species extinct? Or are we going to be able to learn from our past, and I would assert in an act which is uh, ethical in the truest sense, and that in the long term it comes back to benefit we, ourselves and our future generations? Are we going to learn how to grow food and use food in, in ways that are to our long, own long-term benefit? Thank you. Rodale Institute, which is the only one that cared about it, 
and they were true believers, and, and mo no scientist ever believed a true believer. Uh, so it was sort of a feedback loop where it was never studied, but nobody believed it. But there have been more studies, and, and there are some benefits. Um, for instance, uh, I did a little analysis. I, there was an experiment set up in England um, in 1843 by somebody who invented the whole concept of fertilizer. He had, he had done chemistry on plants, saw that plants had nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, calcium in them, and thought, well, maybe if I add these to plants, they'll grow faster. Maybe that's what's in manure that makes plants grow faster. And he tried this, and Leibniz was doing this in Germany at the same time, and the experiment he set up growing wheat is still in existence. It is original treatments are still in existence now. And I analyzed wheat yields in these permanent fertilized, uh, I don't know, five or 10 hectare plots uh, from then till now, and decade by decade by decade, his control was manuring. His con con it was organic agriculture. There's never been a decade where any of his chemical fertilizers have ever given higher yield than the organic control. So organic agriculture doesn't mean it has to be uh, have a low yield, a low productivity. Uh, I think it's, it's harder for some things like fruit crops and so on not to have more loss to pests. Uh, but some crops like wheat don't have much of a pest problem. And so that, that has had sustainable yields. Um, one of the big dilemmas with, with uh, organic agriculture right now is our combined animal feeding operations that tend to have the manure, which is a wonderful source for soil fertility, be a long way away from much of the better farmland. It used to be farmed, had a closed animal manure, was produced in the barn and put out in the field, it was a closed loop. That loop has been broken by having 10,000 or 100,000 uh, chickens uh, in a single building or 20,000 hogs in a building and so on. So it makes it harder to use those techniques. Maybe follow up a little bit on that question. Um, what do you think the role of biodiversity in agricultural systems are? You mentioned that um, bio natural biodiversity can sustain ecosystems and mediate carbon and nitrogen. It seems like with your proposal of adding nitrogen, and you get multinational corporations moving in that start selling fertilizer. And in selling fertilizers, they're also promoting monocultures. Um, and that traditional knowledge oftentimes promotes biodiversity, especially nitrogen-fixing species, in and among the other things that they're growing. What role do you see in that and helping this? Uh, that's another very good question. I don't know if you've all heard it. But, but the role, the question basically is, what about using biological diversity as a tool in agriculture? And what might be, what might be able to be done? Um, the two aren't as distinct as you might think. Um, I've been interacting with some colleagues in China uh, who are at China Agriculture University. Um, and about 20% of the cereal yield in China is uh, what's called overyielding because of, um, of using diversity as an agricultural tool. And specifically, there's, it's been long been a tradition in, in, uh, in, in traditional Chinese agriculture to grow a row of one crop next to a row of a different crop. And these agricultural scientists have studied this now, and they actually know what it is that these plants are doing to help each other. Part of it is that legumes fix nitrogen. There are actually some other things going on. Legumes also, even on high nitrogen soils, legumes have roots that exude organic acids that dissolve phosphorus that the other plants can't get. And they then take it up, and they actually provide more phosphorus to neighboring plants. So even without the nitrogen fixing part, there's a phosphorus effect. So there are these sort of below ground root interactions whereby one plant growing next to you actually provides you with a resource you're not good at providing, but the other one can, you can, they, start, they, they can sort of help each other. And this gives about 20% more food produced per hectare of land in China than if that weren't done. Now Chinese agriculture is not at all mechanized. It really is farmed by hand. I was amazed, I thought they were teasing me, but wheat really still is harvested where you break off the seed heads one at a time and throw them in the egg. That's how farmers harvest their wheat or their rice. So uh, in those kind of situations, they, China has some of the highest rates of fertilization in the world. And even with that high fertilization, they do it in ways which, to a great extent, still take advantage of this intercropping capability, the added yield from intercropping. So I don't think the two need to be distinct. But my fear is that China might become highly mechanized as people flee the farms for factory jobs. Farms have to become larger. If they're larger, they have to be mechanized. Right now, there is no machine that allows you to, to harvest at the right time a, a wheat crop growing next to a bean crop, and then harvest a bean crop at the right time. It's easily done by hand. There could be a machine. I don't see why it couldn't be invented, but they aren't there. 
And I would hate to see a country like China, which already is highly dependent on imports, lose 20% of their annual food production, but they could if they have to give up those more traditional methods. Yeah. Uh, there was some confusion was in your slides. Is it 140% increase or 1.4? I think. Oh, it's a 140% increase. It's 2.4 times. 2.4 times. Yeah. And then, then my follow-up is, particularly in the consequences of energy use and nitrogen use, even for, for the better, better pathways that you show, is the total amount of nitrogen we're going to need increasing? And if so, where, where will it come from? Yeah, the, yeah, unless we have uh, more countries following the path of the ones that have become more nitrogen efficient, if we did that, we could probably have the same amount of nitrogen in the I haven't pursued that analytically to know exactly how that balance is out. So I'm assuming if we follow the path I'm suggesting that we would need 1.3 times current rates of nitrogen use. So 30-some 30, 30 percent more nitrogen than we have right now. Uh, where will it come from? Well, it's made from fossil fuel, basically, from natural gas. That's where it, it comes from. So there are greenhouse gas implications of doing that. Plus, nitrogen fertilizer, when you apply it, is converted, some of it is converted by um, soil microorganisms into nitrous oxide, laughing gas, if you will. And that's a very potent greenhouse gas. I didn't show you all the numbers, because I talked quickly enough as it was and, and almost ran out of time. But I have done all the analyses for greenhouse gas implications of these methods of agriculture. When you cut down a rainforest, 40% of the weight of each tree is the element carbon. And that becomes carbon dioxide when you, when you clear that rainforest to make a farmland. That's an immense release of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere from land clearing. And the biggest storehouse of carbon in the world is in the soils of the earth. And when you farm a field after about 50 years, 30 to 40% of the carbon that was in that soil is then in the atmosphere as greenhouse gas and carbon dioxide. So we looked at all those releases. We looked at the releases from making the fertilizer. We looked at the releases from using the fertilizer and having nitrous oxide. And if we, go, if we go along our business as usual path, we'll be releasing about six gigatons of carbon equivalent to the atmosphere every year from farming. Right now we do eight from fossil fuels. So that's a huge amount of greenhouse gas from farming and land clearing in the future. Six versus our current eight from fossil fuels. So having to go up that amount is a big impact. But we can actually release less if we go by the path I was suggesting. We looked at greenhouse gas, we could, we'd be releasing less around three uh, gigatons per year, 50 years from now, then, uh, and right now we're releasing 3.2. So a little, little bit of a decline. Yeah. just kept the same amount of meat being eaten that we eat, but eat much more efficient meat. Uh, that plus either sort of the trajectory of, of just naturally increased yields in current farming practices, or that plus the, my approach to farming these underused lands uh, would eliminate all need for future land. In fact, it's very easy to envision having oh, 0.2 to 0.3 hectare, billion hectares of land be freed up from agriculture if we did this wisely in the next 40 or so years. Does that answer your question? Okay, good. Yeah. Okay. Well, I was going to ask about, you talked a lot about um, just land use in general, and assuming that basically um, you do sort of one level of land. I was wondering, I've read something, I don't know what the um, current developments in Lafayette yet, but uh, about sort of a form of indoor farming where you sort of um, extend in a vertical direction and you <laughs> I don't know a lot about it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, to some extent, you run out of light. Yeah, uh, yeah, and, and so I, I think what I've seen, our of this suggests that you can sort of layer plants and, and do a, a job of more effective using all the light hitting a system. And if anything which can give higher yield would be great, and we do grow more crops in greenhouse kind of setting. But greenhouses are never going to replace uh, the, the 85 million acres of farmland we have in the United States. Uh, you know, it's wonderful to eat locally. It's a fabulous thing to try to do. Uh, but if, if we all tried doing that, three forces would starve to death. You can't grow enough food locally uh, to actually meet total local needs for most of the country. In a rural area, you could probably do it here. Go to LA, 
New York City, DC, forget it. Right? So it's, uh, I think it's, I, I, I'm delighted by how many people care about food, know about many food issues, and, and things that people are trying to do to, to address these issues. Uh, there's another thing I should say, I don't want to burst too many bubbles, but the energy it takes to move food around the world is about 2% of our total global greenhouse gas emissions. It's really tiny. So, yeah, eating local has many advantages. It doesn't really affect global greenhouse gas levels very much. That's not the big point of it. Um, so, anyway, sorry to burst that little bubble for some reason. Yeah? What would you see as genetic Well, GMOs, so genetically modified organisms, uh, you know, right now, 80 or 90 percent of the corn we grow is GMO corn, also soybeans, we have cotton. Uh, the crops seem to be popular with farmers. Um, I would love to have genetically modified organisms, uh, which the uh, Hugh Grant, not the cute one, but the CEO of Monsanto, the guy named Hugh Grant. Um, <laughs> uh, I'd love to have Hugh Grant be right, uh, and his uh, group of research be right, and and somehow have us find uh, GMO varieties of our crops that can increase yields 30, 40, 50, 60. I mean, they're, they're talking about doubling yields in 20 years. Uh, I looked at the data for our current GMO crops. And right now, year by year, using USDA data, our current crops are lagging non-GMO crops by about 1% in yield, in yield each year. There's a cost, no surprise, there's a trade-off. There are benefits, GMO crops, uh, 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 the, so the BT, uh, crops which have this Bacillus thuringiensis gene in it, which uh, helps uh, affect uh, insect attack and provide sort of a natural insecticide. I think it's a, a major environmental gain. It's much better to have the insecticide there inside the plant, if you will, than have it sprayed across the whole field and exposed farms and everyone else to it. It's a, it's a big environmental advantage. I think there's a chance for GMO crops to offer uh, other advantages, but there's nothing yet to suggest we're going to get the kind of yields we're talking about. It's, there's no ultimate free lunch out there. You have to photosynthesize, you have to make structural material, the plant has to turn it into seed and so on. Um, I don't share their optimism. Um, and I, anyway, I'm sorry about that one. Yeah? I have a, a question that kind of comes up of what you were just saying, but I think in a different way. There are a lot of really bright students in this room that are going to be thinking about graduate school, I'm thinking. So kind of thinking about what you were just talking about, the need for research, I'm wondering if you kind of, if you envision where we have some needs for more research around all of these topics that you talked about, what would be some of the, the top list, the top tier that you would have? More kind of like for the students here that are thinking about where they might go and what might be really good work for them to be getting into. So I think it's a wonderful question. What might be important things to be done along these lines? <coughs> but see, my first advice to everyone is to find what you love and do it. So if you find ideas like this exciting, find the parts that you think are exciting. And I mean, if on the research side, trying to understand global nitrogen cycles, trying to understand how you might minimize loss on an individual farm. I mean, there are questions across this whole gamut that could be asked. Things I know nothing about, but I'd love to see people know how to do. How do you actually find some way there could be a self-autocatalytic process of sharing knowledge and, and uh, so on with farmers around the world so they can actually become self-sustaining with higher and higher yields and do so in a way which minimizes environmental impact of what they're doing. So how could we actually get people to do this? What would it take sociologically? What would it take economically? I mean, you've almost any given discipline here, ethically. I mean, it's, it's um, I could see anyone in this room having almost any given focus and going out and, and uh, finding a very meaningful way to, to direct their life to try to help solve these kinds of issues. This issue, the food issue, and the energy issue, and, and how they interlink with the environment. I think are some of the biggest issues the world has faced ever. And how we solve them during your lifetime is going to determine the kind of world that is created for a long, long time to come. So explicit research, I mean, my first advice is, is, is to have it mean something that you actually already love and find interesting and exciting. And this, is, this is the added advantage that when you're doing something you love and is exciting, you can be really helping shape the, the future of the world and the well-being of, of all of its citizens. I promise you one more question. I see that the uh, people are looking at the exits. Yes. Um, right now, a lot of corn is used as energy. So I just have two questions: Is is it possible to like, harvest the accentuated plant growth that occurs before that zone is created and use that for energy? And if that is, and algae and different fuels in the ocean and stuff because of the nitrogen runoff, how will that affect food supply? Because corn will be needed to be used as 
Yeah, well, right now we use about a third, a little over a third of all the corn grown in the United States, uh, states to make ethanol. And I, I will say in defense of people who, who do make ethanol, when this was started, um, everyone thinking about it, uh, imagined this would be a, a win for everybody. We weren't, it wasn't so clear that we faced the food problems that we now know we face on Earth. Um, it, corn was a, a, a crop that grew, grows in abundance in the Midwest United States, and there wasn't enough demand around the world to use it all up, so we had stockpiles of corn. So we had sort of a leftover surplus crop, which we knew from uh, 3,000 years of making booze, we could turn into alcohol. Uh, and it was done. And so the government, the states and the federal government started encouraging farmers to do this and encouraging businesses to start to, to make it. Uh, and it wasn't until uh, people took a really hard look at the underlying numbers that we realized that, that, in fact, we don't gain very much energy at all. By the time you look at how much energy it takes to grow the corn and to convert it into ethanol, we're not really gaining much new energy for society. And we're causing lots of, of uh, environmental harm, it turns out, by doing this, uh, the whole process. So it, it was a learning process, and the knowledge that, that corn ethanol isn't as wise as it seemed has only been gained in the last two or three years. And I, I don't think that we can have a society where we learn something and then instantly punish people who did three years ago what we said was a good thing. So I think we have to have a way that we can sort of uh, reasonably uh, uh, apply knowledge to the situation as it arises. Um, I would hope in the long term, if we do grow biofuels, I think there is there are ways that we can grow biofuels that, that provide massive net environmental benefits. To do so, we have to use land that no longer is good for agriculture, because as soon as we have food competing with energy, we're going to basically price food at the price of energy, which makes it unaffordable. And we're going to force somebody else to clear land someplace else to grow more food to make up for the food that we divert into the energy crop. But about um, oh, 10 or 20 percent of the land that has been farmed around the world no longer can be farmed because it's basically been worn out by inappropriate agriculture. And those lands can be put back in with native species, which can build up carbon and nitrogen in the soil. At the same time, their above ground biomass can be harvested as an energy source. You can think about it in the long term as a way where you make that land fertile enough eventually to go back into agriculture, put some other worn out land into a long term perennial crop to get that bioenergy and to uh, store carbon and make the soil fertile again. So I think there's some ways we think in the long term about this where we can have good energy crops uh, and give us maybe 10 or 20 percent of our global energy needs uh, and still not have a fight with food. Okay, I, good right. applause. I, I could answer questions forever. <laughs> I think we should quit at this point. Thank you very much for listening.